again. Let's lift our hands all over this sanctuary and thank Him. He's God. He's God. He'll be what you need when you need Him to be it. He shows up in many ways. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for the power of the Holy Ghost. Lord, you come when we need you. You're an ever-present help in the time of need. This morning, I'm asking you for a power, an empowerment upon your people. Strength and help. Restore, renew. Oh, God, we need you this morning. We need you this morning. Just tell the Lord how much you need him. What you had yesterday was wonderful. We thank the Lord for being with us yesterday. But we need a fresh touch today. We need fresh bread off the showbread table this morning. We need the Spirit of the Lord to come down and help us today. We can't do anything without Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We worship you, Jesus. Unchangeable. Unshakable. Unshakable. Unstoppable. Oh, that's who you are. standing. We have several that call that's traveling today for various reasons. Let's pray for traveling mercies. This morning again we're going to pray for Brother Brent Holland. Brother Brent has a cancer or tumor. We're believing God for a miracle for our brother. Precious man of God, there's nothing that's too hard for God. What we've seen here Wednesday morning in our chapel service miraculous things three of our young children were filled with the Holy Ghost a young lady with hurt herself injured herself she threw her crutches down and believed God and then Wednesday night the Spirit of the Lord just moved among us he's moving by his spirit he's still God do you believe that God can heal Brother Holland this morning 
I want you to stretch your hand toward our brother and believe God, Heavenly Father. There is nothing that is too hard for our God. I'm asking you, Lord, that you would bring healing to Brother Brant right now. Lord, you heal all manner of sickness and disease. The stripes that you took on your back 2,000 years ago are sufficient for all healing. We speak life to this body in the name of Jesus. We command this body to line up with the Word of God. Healing is the children's bread. This man is standing on the Word of God. He is standing and believing and trusting in you. Lord, we know that you can. We're asking you to do this work. And Lord, when you do this work, all the glory is going to be given unto you. Lord, we know that you can and that you will. We are believing you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, for those traveling, give them traveling mercy this morning. Those that are sick in body, I'm asking you for healing. Those that are weary in their mind, going through troubles and trials and adversity, I pray, Lord, that the Spirit of a living God would undergird them this morning. You'd give us what we have need of. Lord, we've come to this sanctuary desperate again for you. Oh, God, we ask you to have your way in this service this morning. In the mighty name of Jesus, and everyone said, Amen. And amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Our ushers could come this morning receive the morning tithe and offering. I want to thank you parents and grandparents those of you that are teaching your children to tithe. It is so essential. My mom and dad taught me to tithe when I was just a little boy. Gave us $5 a week for allowance. That's a lot of work for $5 a week. But we had to, we had to get 50 cents in that, in that for tithe. My mom warned me. She said, you don't ever rob God of 10% that is already his. Everything that comes into our hands... We tithe 10%, everything. I remember doing this and, and, and just put a, God, a good, healthy fear of the Lord. And so someone asked me the other day, do you have these little tithes from these children, 25 cents, 50 cents? I said, you just, you receive that, praise the Lord, because parents are teaching their children the importance of tithing, praise the Lord. Prayer revival starts tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. And goes through Wednesday. So that's tomorrow night at 7, Tuesday at 7, and Wednesday at 7. We're going to start right at 7 o'clock. And, and we're going to just consider this like a revival. Now, we're going to be scheduling a revival in October or November, regular revival service. But this is so crucial. The Spirit of the Lord is really moving. Uh, the water is being stirred right now in, in many lives in this church. And I believe the Lord wants us to come together and pray. We have seen miracles from prayer revivals. So I want you to come. If, if you have an appointment, if you already have something scheduled, I have a remedy for that. Cancel it. And come to prayer revival. And pray until you get through praying. When you, when you get through praying, you can just dismiss yourself. We, we'll, hear, we'll hear the roar of intercession when we come into this place. This is where it happens. This is what this is where it all takes place when we begin to pray. This is the war. It's not part of the war. Prayer is the battle. And many lives will be saved through prayer. We'll make it to heaven through prayer. Victories will be won through prayer. Whenever the prophet Moses, uh, he held up his rod. You remember the, Am the Amalekites, they... When Israel was in battle against the Amalekites. Whenever Moses held up his rod, they won the victory. But whenever his hands become weary and he let down the rod, the enemy began to win the battle over the Israelites. This is a type of prayer. When we, we, we begin to pray, we'll do like they did to the Amalekites. We'll disconfit our enemy. We will defeat our enemy when we pray. But if we cease to pray the enemy will get the upper hand. So come, let's see God move in the miraculous through our prayer meeting Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Primetime or San Antonio trip will be leaving September the 8th this week, 28th going through October the 1st. 
Van will be leaving at the church at 8 a.m. Truth Retreat, October the 7th through the 8th, Corsicana, Texas. Cost is $35. If you'd like to attend, see Brother Stephen Taylor. Brother Stephen's preaching somewhere this morning, but he will be here tonight. Amen. Brother Richard Brown, if you would bless that.
to join together for our sister this morning. She's been facing hell for months, really for a couple years. But this morning, she's going to get the victory. Amen. He's able to do it right now. He's an on-time God. He comes when you need him. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Not later faith, but now faith. I want us to agree together for Sister Connie Sexton. Join together with me. Heavenly Father, we're asking you in the name of Jesus to give her complete and total victory. You know the mountains that stand before her, every trial, every tribulation, everything that has befallen this family. We bind the adversary in the name of Jesus. Lord, I'm asking you to release the power of your spirit. Destroy the yoke of the enemy in the name of Jesus. We speak peace be still to this troubled storm. Peace be still in the name of Jesus. Lord, I'm asking you for help right now. We believe that you're going to work a miracle in this life, in the life of this family. There's nothing that's too hard for our God. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Just worship the Lord where you're standing. Just thank Him for healing, for miracles. Maybe you need a breakthrough this morning. Just where you're standing, I want you to call out the need that you have. Maybe you have a loved one. Just for a few minutes before we change the order of this service, I want you just to cry out to the Lord. Ask Him to meet that need. He's waiting on us. Sometimes we don't even ask the Lord. Ask Him in simple faith.
sing it again. to life's big questions why we have to go through why we go through what we go through I don't understand why we get sick especially the ones that are so faithful to God why can't we just die of old age God has a reason and a purpose for everything I don't understand all the troubles why good people go through bad things but he knows God knows we got to trust the Lord in everything that we go through in this life even when you don't understand even when there's not a ready answer trust the Lord look at your life in light of the word of God look in the mirror of God's word see if there's anything you need to change repent of if there's not just ask the Lord to give you grace to get through what you're going through amen God is good. His mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. Why don't you move out from your pew, shake somebody's hand. Tell them you're glad to see them in the house of the Lord this morning. What a beautiful congregation. What a beautiful day for Jesus to come and rapture us out of this place. The Lord is good. the Lord. This time we're going to dismiss all of our children to Children's Church. Age 5 to 12. All the children. Children's Church, age 5 to 12. Have your Bibles this morning if you'll turn to the book of First Thessalonians, chapter number four. First Thessalonians, chapter number four. In verse number thirteen. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others 
which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for what we feel in this sanctuary this morning. We do not take this lightly. We do not take this for granted. We feel the life of the Spirit of the living God. We thank you for the Holy Ghost that makes this service alive, makes it real. I thank you, Lord, for the Word of God that is truly quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even into the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit that joins in the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Let the Word of God deal with our hearts this morning. I pray that you would anoint these lips of clay and anoint every ear. We can hear what the Spirit would say. We ask you in the mighty name of Jesus and everyone said, Amen. I'm going to preach to you today on the thought, Are you rapture ready? Are you rapture ready? I believe that the rapture of the church is the next great event on God's timetable. I believe that with all my heart because I read the Word of God and I look at the signs of the times around me. I know that Jesus himself said that no man knows the day or the hour, not the sun nor the angels. That means that even Jesus himself, while he was on this earth especially, did not know whenever God was going to send him back to get the church out of this place. Anybody foolish enough to say they know and God has spoke to them about a timetable, don't understand the word of God. You need to run from them people as fast as you can. No man knows the day or the hour, but I can tell you this part. We can see around us. We can see the scoffers. We can see the signs of the times. They are everywhere. And I do believe that Jesus is going to get us out of this place very soon. Oh, I believe I'm leaving this world with a shout. Why? Because I am the blood-bought and the redeemed of the Lord and I'm going to be here one moment and the Bible says the next moment I'm going to be gone. We have to look at this in the Word of God because the Bible is clear. It's going to happen in an hour that we think not. But all we have to do is open our eyes today and see it's right around the corner. We can say we, we see these things taking place. All these prophecies, all of these years since I've been alive, the biblical prophecy has been un, uh, b fulfilled before our very eyes. But what we're seeing today is things that are unprecedented. In the last 2,000 years, things haven't taken place as much as it has in the last 50 years. I'm telling you, signs of the times are everywhere. The last 50 years have brought forth more biblical prophecy than the last 2,000 years. Did you hear what I said? A, a knowledge explosion. A, wars and rumors of wars. A, we see all of these things. The mark of the beast. If you don't think the mark of the beast is coming, this new world currency and the chip in the right hand of the forehead, you are sadly mistaken. Uh, oh, but I don't believe I'm going to be here when the tribulation takes place. Uh, Jesus is preparing uh, an evacuation system for you and I. But what we must do is be ready for the rapture of the church. I believe that I'm getting out of here. I believe I'm going to be raptured without a doubt. I believe Jesus will come back in my lifetime. Again, I don't know the day or the hour. I don't know the month. I don't know the year. But I believe that I'm going to be alive. As a matter of fact, it could take place today before I even close this service out. The rapture could take place. The trumpet could sound. And those who are ready are going to be changed, caught up together with the Lord in the air. And the ones that are not ready are going to be left behind. 
mind. I'm here this morning to admonish you to be ready, to be looking, to be waiting, to be preparing as if it's taking place tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, the ones that are going to make it are the ones that are looking and longing for his appearance. He's coming. Are you ready for the rapture? Are you rapture ready? In October 2007, the state of California had the largest evacuation of homes in U.S. history. Emergency personnel evacuated 350,000 homes, displacing almost a million Californians as 16 simultaneous fires swept through their community. I want you to imagine just for a moment someone missing the evacuation. They wake up in the midst of burning rubble. They see that no one is there. Can you imagine? I'm sure it took place. I'm sure that not everyone was evacuated at that time. That's exactly what's going to take place when the rapture of the church happens. Those that thought they were ready, that were not ready, are going to be left behind. Listen, I know this is old-fashioned preaching, but it's true. Nevertheless, we need to preach a little bit more on the imminent return of Christ because if you're ready, you're going to make it. And if you're not, you're going to be left behind. Oh, First Thessalonians. Thessalonians 5 and 9, you say, well, why do you believe that we're going to be raptured before the tribulation? Why do you believe that we're not going to go through the tribulation? Well, there's many passages, but I can give you just a couple. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and 9, Paul says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by the Lord Jesus Christ. At the end of Revelation chapter 3, you see the seven churches of minor Asia. At the end of Revelation chapter number 3, he says, Come up hither, and I will show you things that will be hereafter. Never again in, in Revelation do you hear the word church mentioned, but you do see all the seals in tribulation open up, and all of the hell that's going to be unleashed on this planet. What I believe that the timetable in this passage and in many others show that we are not appointed unto wrath. I didn't say we're not going to go through tribulation. I do not believe we're going through the great tribulation. I'm going to be raptured and then the tribulation, the great tribulation is going to take place. The man of sin, the Antichrist, is going to make his appearance on planet earth and he is going to be a ruler of this world. But I'm going to be around the marriage supper of the Lamb for seven years sitting with my Jesus. I'm going to get ready to come back with him in Revelation chapter 19. Church Church, are you rapture ready? If you're not, it's not too late. It's time to get ready today. If you're not ready, you can be ready. It's time to repent, to live a holy, separated life because Jesus is coming back for a bride that's without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. He's not coming back back for the unclean, the wicked, uh, that one who enjoys sin. Uh, Hebrews 10 and 26 says, for if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the sacrifice of sins, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for a fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that you can repent and come out of sin and live a righteous life, live in the holiness of the Lord Jesus Christ, and be ready for the rapture of the church. The word rapture is a translation from the Greek word harpanzo. It's not, the word rapture is not found in the word of God, but it comes from this Greek word, harpanzo. It occurs 14 times in the New Testament, and it means to carry off by force or to jerk or snatch violently away. What does that mean? That means he's going to, it's going to happen so fast and so fast. Forcefully, The blood bought and the redeemed will be raptured. Jesus himself will get us out of this place. My study of the scriptures convinced me that two of the most important events in world history are the first and second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The first coming. He came as a babe in the manger. He was the Messiah. Aren't you glad that Jesus came as the Messiah to take away the sins of the world? He lived 33 and a half years on this planet as a natural man without sin. He went to that cross and his first came it coming and became the perpetuation, became the, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. 
world. If he had not come the first time, we'd all be doomed and damned for a devil's hell. But the second time he comes, he's coming as the Lamb of God. He's coming as the ruler of the nations. He's coming with a rod of iron. He's coming as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The first time he came as the Messiah, dying on the cross. But the second time he comes, he will come to get his church out of this place. For every prophecy in the Bible about God's birth, his first coming, there are eight about his second coming. For every, Think about that. For every prophecy on the first coming, on the birth of Jesus, are eight on his second coming. The 260 chapters, chapters of the New Testament contain 318 references to the second coming of Christ. I believe there will be two stages of the second coming of Christ. Two stages. You have to understand this. Whenever you look in the Word of God in Matthew chapter 24, it's referring to two different stages. The first stage is the rapture, that imminent return, that snatching away of the church. And then as the church is with Him for seven years, the second part, the second stage of the second part will happen seven years later in Revelation chapter 19. John said, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon it was called Faithful and True and in Righteousness. He doth judge and make war. His eyes were a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but himself and he had a vesture dipped in blood and the armies which were in heaven, that's you and I, followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he shall smite the nations and rule them with a rod of iron. He treadeth the winepress and the fierceness and the wrath of almighty God and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written King of kings and Lord of lords If that don't get you all stirred up I don't know what else would Listen he's coming back And after that rapture Seven years later you and I Will follow Jesus upon white horses And in the battle of Armageddon He will defeat the enemy of our soul But I'm going to preach about the first stage The rapture of that second coming Two stages of the second coming The rapture And then the second part when he comes back in Revelation chapter 19 after the seven year tribulation. He told Philadelphia, the church of Philadelphia in Revelation 3 and 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. Which shall come upon all the earth to try them that dwell upon the earth. The second stage of Christ's second coming as I talked about will happen seven years later. But this rapture. This imminent return is going to be a surprise to everyone. I'm going to preach to you about this thought. Are you rapture ready? And I'm going to deal with six truths about the rapture of the church. Number one, the rapture is an imminent event. What does the word imminent mean? The word imminent means it could happen at any moment. There is nothing else that has to take place in order for Jesus to get us out of here. That means that he could come in the morning when we are having breakfast. He could come in the afternoon when we're at work. Or he could come at night when we're in the bed. And that's exactly what's going to happen. Sometimes it'll be night in parts of the world. It'll be morning in the other parts of the world. But he's coming in an imminent way. It's a sudden way. Oh, come on, church. I'm telling you, he's going to come in an hour that we think not. What does it mean, the imminent return of Christ? It means it could happen at any moment. It means we must be ready for the Lord's return could happen at any time. Titus chapter 2 and verse 13. He urged them looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Number two, the rapture is a surprise event. Many are going to be caught unaware. Can you imagine being in church all your life and knowing about the rapture? knowing about this imminent return of Christ and being caught unaware. That is one of the greatest fears of my life is to live my life. All the, you know, listen to me, church. 
Don't, don't get too deep into a false message over here. I believe in a God of grace and a God of mercy, but I don't want to become a castaway like Paul said he could become a castaway. Yes, you can become cold in your soul. You can move away from the things of God. I don't want to get caught unaware. He said in 1 Thessalonians 5, I'm coming like a thief in the night. When does a thief come? He comes when you least expect it. He wants to surprise you so he can steal from you. Amen? He don't come in the daytime. They come at night most of the time or in the day if you're not there. Nevertheless, it's a surprise event. And that's exactly what's going to take place. The rapture is going to be a surprise. Oh, surprise, surprise. Many people are going to be left unaware. They're going to be surprised. People have written books and prophesied a specific times. Mark them. That give a specific prophecy of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, Jesus said, the son does not know, the angels do not know. It is going to be a surprise event. The Bible just says, be ready at all times. Are you ready today? Are you looking for him? Are you living today like he's coming back today? That's what it's all about, ladies and gentlemen. Are you living today like you're going to die tomorrow? You say, well, preacher, I hoped you would preach something to make me shout this morning. This ought to make every blood-bought child of God shout the victory today. Why? Because we have not been appointed unto wrath. We're getting out of this place. But listen, if if I suffer persecution and go through tribulation before the rapture, it's okay. Listen, in this life you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer. He said, I have overcome the world. The Bible says be ready at all times. Over and over again, Jesus said, be ready. Matthew 24 and 44, therefore be also ready. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Think about what he said here. In such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Most of the time when we think not, we're going to do things. We can move into a spiritual complacency when we think not. It is very, very crucial that you and I understand it could be a surprise. We must be ready at all times. Number three, the rapture is a sudden event. The Paul, Paul the apostle emphasized the suddenness of the rapture when he said it will happen in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. I want you to think about how fast that is. They say a twinkling of an eye is a nanosecond. It's like, it's like warp speed. The, the human brain can't even, even wrap around the speed of a nanosecond. It's going to happen suddenly. What does that mean? It's going to happen before you can do anything. It's going to happen before you can repent. It's going to happen before you can change the direction of your life. It's going to happen before you can decide to follow Jesus all the way. Are you with me today? I said it's going to happen suddenly. It's going to be at warp speed. You will not have time to get right. When it happens, you must already be right. Oh, Matthew 25, Jesus gives the illustration about the ten virgins. Five were wise, five were foolish. Five had oil in their lamps. That's a type of intimacy. Their prayer life was right. They walked with Him. The Spirit of the Lord lived within them. They walked with Him, talked with Him. And they knew this Christ. But five were foolish virgins. They had let their oil run out. At one point in time, they had oil, but they let it run out. There's a time that, that many in the church had walked with Christ intimately. They kept that prayer wheel turning. They kept that fire burning. They knew God, but somewhere along the way, they got distracted. They got complacent. That's exactly what happened with the five foolish virgins. They let their oil run down. And the Bible said, and at midnight, there was a cry made. At midnight, that is that hour that he comes back. At midnight, there was a cry made. And they all went out to meet him, all ten virgins. They went to trim their lamps and to light it. But five had no oil. The five that had no oil looked at the wise and said, Can we borrow some of your oil? And the wise said, We don't have enough for us and you. You need to go get this for yourself. 
Listen, you can't borrow somebody else's oil. You ain't going to get to heaven on somebody else's coattail. Just because your spouse is living for God don't mean you're going to make it. Just because mom and dad are living right or just because you come to a Christian school or you go to a good church, no, you're not going to get to heaven on somebody else's coattail. you got to get this thing for yourself. you got to know him and make him known. Oh, it's got to be something, a relationship between you and the master. He don't care about your resume. He don't care about what has happened in your past. Where are you at today? You can love your spouse with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength uh, 10 years ago, but where are you at today? Do you love them today? Uh, It's all the difference in the world. Uh, And listen, uh, whenever they went to get oil for themselves, uh, the Bible said the door was shut. The door was shut. And then they began to beat on the door. And he said, not, for not so, he said, for you know not when the hour that the Son of Man doth come. He makes it very clear in Matthew chapter 25, that door was shut. In the assemblies of God, we're not in the assemblies, but we have the same 16 fundamentals and the same four cardinal doctrines. Four cardinal doctrines of the assemblies of God is salvation through Jesus Christ. Number two, divine healing. Number three, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And number four, the second coming of Christ. They say you can't even have a Pentecostal church unless you preach on those four cardinal doctrines often. And that fourth cardinal doctrine is the rapture of the church, the second coming of Jesus. There was a time when I was a boy in the assemblies of God when about every other service one of these topics were preached. I'm telling you, as a little boy, they preached on that hour that no man knows. I I could imagine as a little kid coming home and my mom and dad not being there. Or I could imagine in church the the rapture taking place. And I can tell you I knew I wasn't right to meet a right with God I knew I wasn't ready to meet God isn't it something I can tell you every young person every middle age and old knows if you're ready to meet God I sit down with them and I'd ask them are you ready for the rapture and when they hesitate and they go I know that they're not ready listen you must be ready are you rapture ready today you must know that you're ready for the rapture be ready for his appearance that's what they would preach he could come at any hour be ready as a young person I knew where I stood with God you all know my story in 1996 this is what caused me to come back to God I was I was a wayward wayward child I was a back slider one day I made up a story to a young lady on the phone about the rapture of the church. I came under such conviction because I knew I wasn't ready. It's like God gave me a vision of me missing the rapture and what I would feel like in my soul. And here's what haunted me at that moment. The could have, the would have, and the should have if I could just go back. But I couldn't go back. It was too late. Listen, Jesus said... Be ready. I'm going to come in an hour that you think not. Don't live with regrets throughout eternity. Now, today is the day of salvation. I'll never forget the day. That day I felt convicted. I thought I missed the rapture of the church. And then I heard the still, small voice of God and said, Matt Gregory, it's not too late for you. It's time for you to come back today. I'll save you. And I got saved. Praise the name of the Lord. Number four, the rapture is a selective event. The Bible's clear. It isn't for everybody. Not all religions are going. Anybody who says that as long as you're a good person, all religions are going the same place. That's a doctrine of demons. That's satanic. Jesus said in John chapter 14, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man enters unto the Father but by me. Do you hear?
hear what he said? Uh, that means nobody goes to heaven outside of the blood covenant. Uh, you can think all these thoughts. You can rationalize in your natural carnal mind. But I'm going to tell you today, uh, it's the blood of the cross of Calvary that's going to get you to heaven. This cross right here, I want you to picture it uh, in the rim of the supernatural. It's the only bridge from earth to heaven. It's the power of the cross. Oh, we're not getting to heaven any other way. Muslims, unless they come and repent and ask Jesus to save their soul, they're not going to be saved. Hindus, Buddhists, or any other religion, there's only one God. His name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He is the Son of the living God, and He is the only way to get to heaven. Those that are living right are going to make it to heaven. You say, well, righteousness, our righteousness is as filthy rags. Absolutely. I can't be good enough. I cannot work my way into heaven. But I can tell you this. I must abide in Him, John 15. I must abide in Him and I must keep His word. It's all about relationship. You say, well, what about the rules? I can tell you something. I have convictions in my heart. There are things I don't do and there are things I feel convicted to do. But those things are not what saved me. I am saved by the blood of the cross. I am saved by a relationship with Jesus Christ. What is the key, preacher, to living a consecrated, rapture-ready life, fall in love with Jesus, uh, walk with him in the morning, in the afternoon, and at night. Uh, when you fall in love with Jesus, everything else will line up. Uh, you won't have no problem keeping the word of God. Uh, you'll want to be obedient to the word of God. Do you hear what I'm saying? Uh, you'll want to do those things that the natural flesh doesn't want to do. Are you rapture ready? It's a selective event. That means only the blood bought and the redeemed are going. Those who are living holy separated, prepared lives. I got news for you. Liars are not going in the rapture. Drunks are staying here. Fornicators and adulterers will not be in that meeting in the air. Idolaters in the church are going to be in for a big surprise. Thieves will wish they never took what did not belong to them. I'd be caught up on your tithe when the rapture takes place. It is a selective event. Not everybody's going, ladies and gentlemen. It's only for the blood-bought and the redeemed of the Lord. Again, Jesus said, the bride that had made herself ready. She's made herself ready. She's prepared. You know, I just now gave away my daughter to be married to a man. And, and during that preparation time, she was making herself ready. I mean, there was a preparation time for that event to take place. I still remember whenever I married Sister Tori Taylor. And I remember that day of our wedding and all the things that led up to that thing. There was a preparation time. Well, I can tell you there's going to be a wedding in the clouds one day in the, in the heavens. It's the bride. We are the bride and he is the groom. Have you made yourself ready? Have you prepared yourself for that meeting in the air? It's a selective event. Not everybody's going. Number five, the rapture is a spectacular event. No scene described in the Bible is more glorious, stunning, or sensational than the second coming of Jesus. Now, I talked about the second stage of that second coming, and that's in Revelation 19, after the seven-year tribulation. Oftentimes, our focus is on that second stage of that second coming. But I can tell you, that first part is going to be sensational. It's going to be a spectacular event. And I, I want you to be the judge of how spectacular it's going to be as we look at what the Word of God says about it. I want to present to you my case for this spectacular event called the rapture. Verse 16 says, For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. As you read these words, the Lord Jesus Christ is seated in the heavens at the right hand of the Father. Can you picture this? Right now, where is Jesus? He's on the right hand of the Father right now. This is what the Scripture teaches. The Holy Ghost is here. He is the Comforter. He's the one that reproves the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Holy Ghost is the one that brings conviction. He's the one that brings all things to our remembrance, everything that Christ has said. So the Holy Ghost is here, but Jesus is on 
the right hand of the Father. So what's going to happen? Jesus is going to rise up from that place on the right hand of the Father and He's coming to get us out of here. Listen, if that doesn't excite you, uh, again, I don't know how else to excite you. Uh, He said He's going to get us out of here. It's not the angels or the Holy Ghost, but the Lord Himself who is coming to draw believers into the heavens. It is going to be spectacular. The details of this passage paint an amazing, complete, sensory picture of the rapture. Paul even gave the sounds that will be heard. He says, a shout, the voice of an archangel, and the trump of God. Paul is not describing three separate sounds. He is describing one sound three different ways. The sound will be like a shout ringing with commanding authority, like the voice of an archangel. It will also be like the blare of a trumpet in its volume and clarity. And the sound will be exclusively directed, heard only by those who have placed their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm saying the world's not going to hear that trumpet, but you and I, we are going to hear that trumpet sound. And the Bible says the mortal is going to put on immortality and we shall be changed. If that is, listen, it's something to be excited about today. It's going to be A spectacular event. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he shouted this in John chapter 11 and 43. Lazarus, come forth. I read behind one writer that said, if Jesus wouldn't have said Lazarus' name, everybody in the grave would have came out that day. If it had just said, come forth. Everybody would have came out from those graves. Well, I can tell you, I believe that's exactly what it's going to be like. The Bible says that the dead in Christ are going to rise first. What's going to happen whenever he comes back, when Jesus gives that voice of an archangel, the Bible says the dead in Christ are going to rise first. That's even before we get caught up in the air. They're going to come out of the graves. You say, well, can you explain this and this and this? No, I cannot explain all the supernatural events that are going to take place. I just know they're going to come out from the graves and they're going to be caught up first and then you and I that are ready, watching, we're going to be caught up with them to meet the Lord forever in the air. Listen, I believe you're going to know your loved ones when you get to heaven. I believe you're going to know all the things you've been through. I believe the Lord's still going to wipe away the tears from your eyes. I believe what the Bible says. We are going to be raptured out of this place. What would happen? What would happen if you're not ready? If you're not ready, you will be left behind. Number six, the rapture is a strengthening event. After completing his description of the rapture to the Thessalonians, Paul wrapped up the passage with a practical admonition. 1 Thessalonians 4.18, Wherefore, he says, comfort one another with these words. It's a strengthening event. I want to comfort you like Paul comforted the church, the Thessalonian church. Listen. The children of God that die, they're just sleeping. You're going to see them again. We say this at at funerals, at graveside services. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. I'm here to comfort you today. Death is really not a big deal. You say, well, preacher, do you want to die today? No, I want to live until God gets through with me. Amen. But if today he wants me out of here, I'm going to be transported into the realm of the supernatural. Uh, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Uh, Christian death is not permanent. It's merely sleep. A time is coming when we and our loved ones will be reunited in a rapturous meeting. 19th century Bible teacher A.T. Pearson made this interesting observation about these things. Here's what he says. It is a remarkable fact that in the New Testament, so far as I remember, it is never once said after Christ's resurrection that a disciple died. That is, without some qualification. The Bible said in the book of Acts, Stephen fell asleep. David, after he had served his generation by the will of God, fell asleep and was laid with his father. Peter said, knowing that 
I must shortly put off this my tabernacle as the Lord showed me. Paul says, the time of my departure is at hand. Now, looking at Paul's statement, the figure here is taken from a vessel that as she leaves a dock, throws the cable off the fastenings, and opens her sail to the wind to depart for the haven. So what he's saying is, uh, this is a temporary thing. Uh, What are you trying to say? I'm saying a a Christian really doesn't die. We fall asleep uh, because we are going to wake up in glory. Amen? Uh, I said, heaven's really real, church. Uh, Yes, hell is really real. And the Bible says uh, it is enlarging itself daily. But I got good news for the born again child of God. Heaven is a real place. And many of us, listen, it won't be long. Maybe some of you will be there. That is why Paul wrote that we should comfort one another with these reminders. That for Christians, we, what we call death is nothing more than a temporary sleep. Before we are called into our uninterrupted relationship with Christ forever. Can someone come to the piano? The rapture is an imminent event. The rapture is a surprise event. It's a sudden event, a selective event, a spectacular event, and a strengthening event. My question to you today is this. Are you ready for the rapture? Again, I, I counsel different ones and And I'll ask them, are you ready? Especially those that have been taught the word of God. Are you ready? Are are you living right? And I can either look at their face and I can tell where they stand. Or oftentimes they'll say, no, I'm not ready. If, if, listen, God's grace covers our mistakes. And that's not saying that you go out and commit willful sin. That's not what I'm saying. God's grace is sufficient to cover our mistakes I'm not referring to willfully going out and and doing something you know is wrong. God's grace is sufficient. But we know when we are walking in His readiness and in His rightness, and we know when we are not. He is merciful. Why won't He tell us when He's coming? Why is it such a surprise event? I'll tell you why it's such a surprise event. It's the mercy of God. The imminent return, the sudden return, the surprise return of Christ is a safeguard for our souls. Do you know that? It's a safeguard for our souls. He warns, Paul warns, Peter warns, Jesus warns to be ready. He's coming like a thief in the night and an hour that you think not. If we knew Whenever Jesus was going to come, we'd never exercise our faith. Number two, we could time it just right. No, he wants you to live for him every single day. Listen, some of us will die before, unless the rapture takes place today or in the next year. Some of us in this house may not be here. You may go by the way of the grave. It's the same mindset. You must be prepared. You must be ready. Whether it's your heart stops beating or the rapture takes place, wherever the tree, we are trees of righteousness or unrighteousness in the word of God, wherever the tree falls is where it lies. You must be ready. There must be an anticipation every single day. You're looking for the coming of Jesus. You're looking every single day. This doctrine of the rapture is a safeguard for our souls. Can we stand? Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 48. I'm going to close this with the words of Christ, the urgency in his voice. Verse 48, he says, But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to eat, begin to smite his fellow servants, and eat and drink with the drunken, The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour that he is not aware of and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. 
There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I want to point a few things out here. But if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delays his coming. He says, They've been preaching this since I was a kid. (laughs) They've been saying Jesus is coming for years. He hasn't come. Listen. Scoffers in the last day, Paul also says, and they will say, where is the promise of His coming? They've been preaching this for years. If you're a scoffer and you're mocking it, you're fulfilling biblical prophecy today. You're a part of biblical prophecy. You're a, you're a scoffer. Oh, they've been preaching this all my life. I remember when I was in Children's Church at Victory Assembly of God in Hattiesburg. They preached on the rapture. They said, they said yeah, this year is probably going to be the year. I'm thinking, I'm not even going to make it to 10 years old. I'm 9 years old. That's the way it must be preached. If that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delays his coming, I'll get right later. And he begins to smite his fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunken. So what he's doing is, or what she's doing, is they're compromising, they're doing things they would not do if they knew Jesus was going to come back tomorrow. If there's anything that you're doing that you would stop doing if you knew Jesus was coming back tomorrow, you're probably not rapture ready. If there's anything that you would change suddenly because you know it ain't right, if there was some way we could know the time, if there was some way we can't know, but if there was some way that I could know that tomorrow at 12 o'clock, Jesus is coming back. And I would begin to search my heart and go, okay. I said that I forgive my brother, but I think I still have all with him. I'm, I'm going to go to him right now. I'm going to make it right. And then I'm going to come offer my gift. Did, 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 have I left anything undone? Is there anything in my heart that's still lingering there? Is there, is there anything, that, is there any idolatry in my heart? Is there any lustful things that have gotten a hold of me? Any, anything that I have not gotten victory over? If we could know that Jesus was coming back tomorrow at 12 o'clock and we would race to repent, we're probably not ready for the rapture. You say, well, preacher, that's crazy because if we knew he was coming tomorrow at 12 o'clock, we'd all be in a prayer meeting. We would. But you can live in such a way every single day in that intimacy with Christ where you're walking with him, you're talking with him, You're making the right decisions. You're turning your head from ungodly filth. You're making decisions. You say, what's too hard, preacher? I can tell you, two seconds in hell, you'd say, if I could just go back, I'd get victory over everything. You say, well, it it only happens for the strong. No, I can tell you, two seconds in hell, if I could go back, I'd change it all. But you can't go back. The Lord of that servant, if he begins to do those things, Thinking the Lord's delaying him. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Lord called him a servant in verse 48. He's going to appoint him his portion with the hypocrites because he wasn't ready. He's doing stuff he knew he shouldn't have done. I know this is old-fashioned preaching, but it's Bible preaching. It's Bible preaching. It'll help us. It'll get us to heaven. we got to live like He's coming back tomorrow. Are you living like He's coming back tomorrow? I can tell you, I've I've testified. uh, We prayed for Brother Brant today. Whenever Sister Brant was on her deathbed, I don't think I've ever met anyone like this woman. She looked at me and she said, Oh, Brother Matt, I'm fixing to enter into the presence of God. She said, I'm excited to see Jesus. I was like, wow, this woman is a woman of God. Do you live with that kind of expectation and and anticipation to see Him? So much so that you long to be in His presence? Listen, they say you can become so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Wrong. The flesh will balance it out, I promise you. 
You can keep your eyes upon him and you can constantly be ready. Are you living like he's coming back tomorrow? That should have been the title of the message this morning. Are you living like he's coming back tomorrow? All the excuses, the lame excuses, all of our pity party, weak flesh, human excuses go out the window. If we could know Jesus was coming back tomorrow at 12 o'clock, what would you change? What would you change? Here's the sad part. When the rapture takes place, we can't change anything. I'm going to close with this thought. If you've been attending this church long enough, you've heard me preach this. These left behind movies, they're good entertainment, but you better not believe a word of it. Paul says in Thessalonians, makes it very clear that if you are inside or outside the church and you've received the knowledge of the truth that you might be saved and you reject it, and you miss the rapture, God's going to send you strong delusion. You will believe a lie in tribulation, and you will be damned. Everyone who had pleasure in unrighteousness. If you have one of these Life in the Spirit study Bibles, their footnotes say that. The fire Bibles say that. The Baptist Hebrew and Greek, the, the, the really straight Baptist scholars, preach the same message. It's in the Word of God, guys. This ought to be something that drives us to purity, intimacy, good decisions. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. Think about it. We're gambling. Every day we get in that car, it's more dangerous to drive. Y'all say, well, Brother Matt, he's going to Central America. I think it's more safe in Central America than it is in in parts of uh, Tyler around here. It's safer to be on a plane than it is in a car. Every day we put our lives in jeopardy. When you're just going through that green light right here in Gresham, and then somebody's looking at their phone, and they run that red light and T-bone you, you're in eternity, and nothing else matters but where you were with God when you died. But but I, I just don't have time to come to church. It's too far. The gas is too high, and the kids have ball games. You're crazy. You're crazy. Wake up. Wake up. Jesus is coming soon. He loves us so much. I'll never forget the still small voice of God whenever I was telling the story as if the rapture had taken place and I felt the fear of what it would be like in tribulation. I heard the voice of Jesus say, it's not too late for you. And I felt conviction again for the first time in years and I came down to an altar in my home and I got saved and I was born again in the Spirit of God. I got a word for everyone in this house. Whether you're saved or you're lost, it's not too late for you. It's not too late for you. Jesus loves you so much. All the excuses go out the window. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, I preach what you give me to preach today to this beautiful people. These are your people. Some here maybe are not saved, not living the way they should live. They're not rapture ready. Lord, I pray the Spirit of God would prick their hearts, that you would draw them to the bleeding side of Calvary today. Oh, God. Oh, God, we've been foolish. We wanted this world so bad. We get so captivated by the deceitfulness of riches and all the pleasures of this life. In every single day, every one of us in this sanctuary and those watching by Facebook are one heartbeat away from eternity. Holy Ghost, help us today. Help us today. I want us to come and find a place to pray around these altars. Come find a place to kneel. Listen to me. If you don't have enough room to kneel, come and stand up against the wall. Stand, get, get as close as you can. There needs to be a reality check for all of us. Every thought and intent of the heart must be filtered through the Word of God and by the power of the Holy Ghost. 
When he comes, he's going to come suddenly. It's going to be a surprise. It's going to be a great and terrible day. It's the blessed hope of the redeemed. But there's going to be many, many tears from those inside and outside the church that play games that just really never got serious with God. It's not too late to get serious with God. It's not too late this morning to become a radical Christian.
must say this. There are people who will say, well, I just don't believe like that. I don't believe you have to live that straight. I don't believe you have to to live that separated from sin. I don't believe you have to be like that. Well, the Bible says you do. And this is what I tell people who say, I don't believe like that. I just believe I'll still make it and all this kind of stuff. My response to them is this. Are you willing to risk your eternal soul on what you're saying right now? That is something I don't play with. We can agree to disagree on a lot of theological differences. But when it comes to a human soul, I love people. I love people. I want you to get to heaven. I'm going to tell you the whole truth. Nothing but the truth. Even if it hurts. We make too many excuses. We live like we got plenty of time. The young, middle-aged, and old. I see older folks, not so much in this church, but I do see older folks living like they got another 30 years and they're 85 years old. They're cold in their soul. They have all against family members. Man, you're right there at death's door. And I'm thinking, you better get it right. You're about to meet God. And here's what it all comes down to. This Bible right here is going to judge every one of us in the last day. You're not going to be judged by this preacher. I'm not going to be judged by you. You're not going to be judged by me. But the Bible is going to judge us. So if I have to lean in one direction or the other, I'm going to be real conservative with my soul. Father, I thank you for this congregation. Thank you, Lord, for the love and the mercy, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let it become real to us. Let the word become more real than ever before. Let us live every moment like you're coming back in 30 minutes. Lord, when we do this, when we're constantly looking, waiting with great anticipation for the coming of the Lord, we'll make different decisions. We'll do things different. We'll live a victorious life. And help us to see, Lord, that you're coming back for a bride that has made herself ready. Let this word lodge deep within our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. Church time tonight, 6 o'clock. Come expecting the Lord to move in this house. Hallelujah.